Oh, my battery's died on the camera before, but basically what happened was it counted down and uh, it finished its cycle and beeped and everything seemed normal. So I'll just show that real quick. Just give it a 10 second. So that's doing exactly what it should do. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, reattach this wire for the primary winding of the transformer. So what will happen is when I uh, fire it up now, I fully expect it to blow that fuse. But just for a moment before it blows the fuse, I should be able to hear the magnetron come on and I might be able to tell just from the noise coming from like the transformer and the high voltage section there, I might be able to tell whether or not I've got a bad short in that section or whether or not the fuse just blows because it, it just can't handle the uh, extra current draw. So if you look right up in this area right here, you might even actually witness the fuse blowing. Let me go 10 seconds. Okay. It never even tried. It uh, basically immediately smoked that fuse. That doesn't necessarily mean a dead short in the high voltage section, but it doesn't, doesn't necessarily bode well either. All right, so here's something you definitely don't want to do. Um, that's an AGC-sized fuse. Uh, it's 15 amp. It's the correct amperage, but it's it's uh, AGC sized and I've just got it basically forced into the small holder there and it's just making enough contact so that it actually uh, should run. So I'm obviously not going to just uh, live with that but I just want to see whether or not the thing will work because quite frankly if this blows then I know I've got a bad component in the high voltage section of this microwave and you know, it's just not going to be worth repairing. As opposed to if everything else is normal, then I can just assume that there was just a power surge that caused the fuse to blow. And I can either get the proper size fuse, or quite frankly, that fuse holder is so cheesy. I might just even uh, do something as, uh, as nuts as just solder that sucker right in there. But the main thing I want to do now is, again, see what happens. We're either going to get instantaneous fuse blow which is dead short in the high voltage section or very loud humming followed by fuse blow which is uh still a short in the high voltage section but more likely magnetron as opposed to like the diode or the hv capacitor so let's see let's go with uh let's try five seconds wow right away that's unfortunate <laughs> it's funny. I didn't even notice it when I was first looking at this, but the diode's right here. So I'm not sure what this white pack is right here, what the purpose of this thing is, this white package that's zip-tied in place. I wonder if there's another fuse in there. Well, anyways, this is my diode. And so the diode goes from here down to a, ground, a screw that grounds it to the chassis. So if I go right across here... I can actually see well my meeting on my reader is not a short my meeting is my meeting my reading on my meter is not a dead short across the diode it's actually acting like that capacitor is charging if anything so that's interesting so let's see we pull this lead off of the cap and then I go from here to here that's directly off the capacitor and you can actually see the resistance is slowly going up that's exactly what you want it to do it's it's acting like a charging capacitor what that tells me is that all of this stuff is hunky-dory well, all right, so we can do a couple of checks on the transformer. Um, the transformer basically has the primary winding uh, where the power comes in. You can 
check that. The problem is that that actually normally has such a low resistance um, that it's going to read so low it's going to look like a short. And it's pretty hard to tell whether or not it is shorted unless you have a really accurate meter with good leads. Or maybe a, a ringer, which I have, but I'm not going to bother breaking that out. Mainly because a short on the primary winding is so rare. I mean, actually, my experience, like I said earlier, is that these transformers failing at all other than burning open. So primarily what you're looking for on the primary winding is whether or not it's open. You're getting a reading of 3.8 ohms, which seems very low, but it, it actually it's pretty normal. Oh, so uh, while I've got this plug off of the primary, I'm going to do a quick check. And I'm going to go from the one lead on e either one of the primary uh, connections over to the secondary high voltage tap. And I'm looking for infinite resistance there which I have um, and then also on these connections here coming up to the magnetron which I'm not surprised if you have any reading at all between those two then you've got a short of some type between the primary and secondary winding which is even rarer than the other stuff we were talking about also check to, to, the, to the ground the case of the transformer any reading at all, then you've got a short of some type from the primary winding to ground. Primary winding's checking out perfectly fine, so I'm going to hook that back up. Going to remove the wire to the high voltage tap on the transformer, which usually that stands alone. So that, that connection right there is actually uh, kind of like sits alone, separate. And that's a tap that actually, that upper coil there is the uh, the high voltage winding. That's got, if we would take that lamination off and look at it, it would be smaller conductor wire and a whole lot of it wound on there because it's a step-up transformer. Whereas down below here, we've got this loop of wire going through here that actually is the, um, I'm not talking about this coil here. I'm talking about there's actually a, just a, a few turns of this wire that are around the core right there because if you notice there's actually three wires coming up here to the uh, magnetron and the reason why is because there's actually two circuits there's one circuit that's sending uh, low voltage to the filament because the magnetron is essentially a vacuum tube and we have to get the filament heated uh, via that winding and then uh, it's the uh, high voltage that actually does the bulk of the work coming off of that tap through the capacitor and the diode which acts as a voltage doubler so again like I already said it's a simple uh, very simple circuit oh uh, I, I don't think I ever mentioned it but in case you're wondering it's probably around three to five kilovolts is what's uh, coming out of here and it's rectified so it's a DC okay so now the uh, the secondary uh, tap, high voltage tap, actually, the, the other end of the winding is grounded. So if I go to ground from that tap, I'll actually be measuring the high voltage tap. And it's 54 ohms, which, as memory serves me, I think somewhere between like 50 and 70 ohms is normal. It's been a while since I worked on one of these. But there's nothing to really indicate that that's a short circuit. So, something else is going on here. I'm beginning to now suspect that we've got something crazy going on with this voltage doubler circuit here. That it might be this diode has become what's called leaky. A leaky diode. Uh, which means that leakage current is being allowed to flow through the diode to ground on both the positive and negative cycle so what we have is AC voltage which AC voltage is an alternating current so it's actually alternating from a positive voltage down through zero back to a negative voltage and then back up again and that's constantly 
happening. It's a repeating cycle. So you have cycles per second or hertz. And in the U.S. here, we've got 60 cycles per second. So 60 times a second, the voltage in, in an AC circuit is actually going up to its peak value, back down again, crosses the zero point, and goes down to negative uh, peak value, and then back up to zero, and then starts over again. And if we were to look at that on an oscilloscope, it would create what is known as a sino, sinusoidal waveform, yeah. or sine wave for short. So what the diode does is the diode is basically like a one-way valve. It's, it's designed to conduct in one direction. So <clears throat> what ends up happening is it's going to conduct during half of that waveform. Um, and not conduct during the other half. Well, because one end of the diode is tied to ground, essentially what it does is it, it grounds out half of that waveform, for lack of a better term. So what you end up with is you end up with a, a pulsating DC. The problem is if the diode gets leaky and the one-way valve aspect of it kind of goes away and it allows current to flow on both ends of the the cycle, then you end up with excessive current flow to ground, which causes too much current to flow through the whole circuit and pops the fuse. Okay, so I've disconnected the two leads that go to the uh, capacitor, and I disconnected the uh, lead that goes to the tap on the uh, transformer. So basically, the only thing I've added to the cir into the circuit from the last test uh, where well from the uh, previous test where I unloaded the whole thing is I've now got the transformer in circuit so there's absolutely no reason why this should blow a fuse because the transformer unloaded shouldn't be drawing that much current and the reality is that I already just did my resistance checks and it actually looks pretty normal so let's see well that's very weird all right, so the only thing I didn't really investigate was what the heck this was. And then when I popped it out of its holder there, I realized, oh, that's just a component that's in series with this line that came off the high voltage tap and then goes direct, directly over to the high voltage capacitor and diode. So I think this is some sort of a fusible device. It's actually marked... 5 kV slash 0 0.7 amps. So I think this is a uh, high voltage fuse, which is interesting because I've never seen one in all of my years of working on microwaves. They never used to include these. It's measuring about an ohm. You know, back in the day when I was working on these things, every microwave oven that you opened up had an envelope in it with a wiring diagram. Well, they got cheesy on us, okay? Here's our diagram. Schematic diagram. And you can actually see it actually says, note, door is closed, unit is not operational. Because they want to basically give you an idea of when you're looking at any of the switches or relay contacts in this schematic, what state they're in. So the interlock switches, if they're shown open or closed, that's the state that they're normally in when the door is closed. Because some switches will open when the door opens and some will close when the door is uh, open. It, it's not always... It's not always going to be the switch opens when the door opens. Um, so we can see. We're not interested in all of this interlock and all of this stuff. We're looking at the high voltage. And sure enough, that right there, that device, that is a symbol for a fuse. Uh, and they are calling that SH. You can see this is the high voltage winding. It goes through SH and it goes right to the capacitor. There you can see that, that symbol right there. That symbol right there is the symbol for a resistor. And you can see it's inside this dotted uh, line 
that is the capacitor. So they're basically showing you that, yes, this is the internal bleeder resistor that I was explaining uh, about earlier. This is responsible to high resistance um, resistor that basically when the circuit's operating, it's barely noticed. But when the microwave shuts off, this resistor will bleed off any charge in this capacitor. So if this internal resistor opens, then this capacitor can become a lethal shock hazard. All right, so instead of uh, continuing to waste expensive fuses, um, I just made up this little jumper. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hook directly to the primary of the uh, high voltage transformer with this little setup here and I'm going to use my Sencor power right which is essentially it's a variac isolation transformer and uh, current meter all in one and I'm gonna slowly bring up the voltage on this transformer and see how many amps it's drawing because like I said something just doesn't seem right all right, so for those of you who haven't seen it before, this is my Sencor AC Power Right uh, PR57. And this is uh, handy for diagnosing and working on uh, various electronics. But basically what it is, it's, it's a uh, multifunction. It uh, displays uh, AC line voltage, what it's seeing at the line that it's plugged into. But then it also will display what the output is, which is controlled by this knob here. It can go from zero to up to line. And actually, you can actually step up and go over the line voltage a little bit if you wanted to for some reason. Then it also has built-in current meters. It has two ranges, uh, zero to one and a half amps, zero to four amps. Um, it also has a um, watt meter built in. It also has... AC leakage, which is done with a probe that plugs into here, but we're not concerned with that today. Uh, so what I basically am going to do is I'm going <clears> to <throat> plug this uh, jumper wire I made directly into here and slowly bring up the voltage while monitoring the current to see what happens. Now, I actually have a current, currently I have an issue with this. It works as far as the Variac feature and everything, but the voltage meter is reading incorrectly and it's probably a bad shunt resistor that I haven't uh, had time to deal with because I just don't do service anymore. So, um, But for instance, right now, if I put it on the line, it actually is showing 50 volts, which is not correct at all. It's actually, if I were to plug my multimeter in there, my line voltage would probably be around 118 or something like that. So when this is reading 50, in reality, it's actually at the line voltage. So if I put this to output and I bring the Variac up, you can see that is now at line voltage, not 50. And you can actually see that I can actually go over. But all I want to know is when I'm, you know, kind of in the ballpark, I could I could just hook up my meter and measure and monitor it as I go along, but I'm not going to bother doing that. So what we're going to do is, when the boiler shuts off so that's quiet, I'm going to uh, plug this thing in, and we'll see what happens. Well, that boiler's probably going to run for a while, um, so I'm just going to I'm close up to the camera. Hopefully, the audio will be clear. Um, so I've got it plugged in, but I've got it at zero volts. Uh, so for starters, I'm going to put it right on the uh, current range, and I'm going to bring it up slowly and see what happens. You can see I'm barely doing anything voltage-wise, and I'm up to one and a half. It's drawing one and a half amps right there. And I'm barely moving the voltage scale, even though it's reading incorrectly. So that's going to be a ton of current before I even get anywhere near line voltage. So let's uh, let's go to the zero four amp range, and continue to bring in the voltage up. I 
can feel I could feel my my power right starting to actually vibrate so we got some power getting in there and it just popped the uh, safety overload on the power right so now you see I have no output all right, so the power right uh, fuse in the back here calls for a 4 amp slow blow fuse and I had a 4 amp quick acting fuse. That's still interesting. That would still indicate to me that more than 4 amps was flowing through there even though I didn't go to full scale on my amperage, uh, on my ammeter setting. I wonder whether or not I've got something else going on here with the power right. Maybe not just the voltages incorrect. Maybe the uh, current meter is not all reading correct either. So now, see my output is output is back. There's line. And if I bring this up, yeah, should be able to. Okay, so let's try this again. Go back to, yeah, it's doing the same thing. So let's see, that is right there. How many amps is that? That's at three amps. That's at three and a half amps right there. I'm gonna have to meter that voltage with my DVM to see what it actually is. Wow, so um, I'm only putting 22.7 volts into that transformer and um, I'm drawing, let's see, let's tweak this up to get the three and a half, 23 volts into the transformer primary and I'm drawing three and a half amps and the transformer is not doing anything. It's it's completely unloaded. So why the hell is it drawing so much current? It's got to be it's got to be maybe that the primary winding is way too low in resistance that maybe there's some shorted windings on the primary. I and mean, that's the only thing I could think of. Well, I've only got a 4 amp fuse in there. So I'm kind of pressing my luck. I'm already in the red line area here of the uh because the power right's basically designed for servicing uh, consumer electronics like stereos and TVs. So basically that's why they give you this red scale area over here to say anything about 3 amps is basically kind of loony for a TV or a stereo. Unless you're working on some big honking power amplifier. Like a big class A thing. That's probably 3.75 amps right there. And we're just under 25 volts. Now, I don't want to stick my hand in there right now and get shocked. But I'm going to let it run like that just for a little bit. And then I'm going to shut it down. And I'm going to see if that transformer has gotten hot. It's been uh, running for a while now. and. My power right's getting pretty hot. I've been abusing the hell out of that. And the transformer. is barely warm. Barely warm. It's weird. Very weird. Well guys, I guess I'm going to have to call it quits on this microwave because my conclusion is uh, that I've got a bad transformer. And I'm basing that conclusion on the fact that with the high voltage secondary tap of the transformer disconnected and with all of the wires going to the magnetron, even the wires going to the capacitor, I basically got the transformer isolated from the circuit and when I hook the primary of the transformer up, it's drawing enough to blow a 15 amp fuse. So uh, at this point, 
I have to make the conclusion that the transformer is in fact the culprit in this microwave oven, even though the resistance readings I'm getting appear to be within normal range. But the problem is I don't know what the actual nominal um, reading should be. For instance, you know, on that primary, uh, some of those primaries go down to, you know, 0.2 ohms. Um, I forgot what I actually measured on this primary, but it could be that there are just several shorted turns in there and it's dropped, you know, the resistance might be 25, 30% lower than what it should be. So, um, I guess this thing's going to be junk. Well, okay guys, I pulled out the transformer just for the heck of it. It's, uh, well, as I pretty much suspected, it's made in, uh, Actually, this does not say... All right, uh, this doesn't say that it's made in China, but it's made by the Guangdong Galans Electrical Fittings Manufacture Company Limited. <laughs> so, draw your own conclusions. So, uh, I figured before I closed out this video... I do what everybody was hoping I would do, which is just plug this thing directly into the outlet, which at that point, the only current limiting will be the uh, circuit breaker over at my main panel, which I think that's going to be a 15 amp breaker because I'm using the outlet that my shop lights are plugged into. So if it trips that, I'll be plunged into darkness. So I've already got my flashlight handy. So let's uh, let the carnage ensue here. Those of you individuals who just can't get enough of that kind of stuff. Ready? One, two, three. Okay, so... I'm not drawing enough current to pop the circuit breaker, which is good, but I can hear the cooking. I can literally hear that winding frying. So now that I know that it's not going to do anything violent, let me get the microphone of the camera up a little closer for you guys. I just tried with my finger and yeah, that's getting hot. Let's see if you can hear it. One. Two, three. Oops. That's that's these uh, these wonderful non-standard terminals on here. Trying to get a quarter inch uh, connected to crimp onto there. One, two, three. Shop lights flicker when I first do it. There's a lot of current flowing through there. Not sure how much. Okay. I could feel this wire I was holding in my hand starting to heat up. <laughs> so there's a ton of current flowing through there. And uh, I can actually hear a little bit of crackling in, in that coming out of there. I'm not sure if it came... Oh, you hear that? As it was cooling down, it made another weird little sound. Right now, that winding is cooking hot. If I touch it with my finger, I may even get burned. So the, I'm satisfied. Well, I was already satisfied. But that brings up an interesting point about, well, YouTube and the Internet in general. Um, you know, I happened to look at a lot of other videos just out of curiosity to see what was out there, and it was kind of surprising and oh boy I just realized I could smell that I could smell that insulation melting on that transform it's disgusting anyways it smells like pork fried rice <laughs> hey yeah uh, so anyways uh what I was saying was the uh the information that's out there you know uh, a lot of guys just oh you know open up a microwave oven and it's the first one they've ever worked on and they glean some information off of the internet which is correct uh, partly correct, but not entirely correct, 
and then they use that and then they turn around and make their little diagnosis video and the point uh yeah what is your point steve oh i guess what i'm what i'm noticing is a lot of there's a lot of information on testing these transformers with an ohm meter and it's interesting to me that the majority of the um these these uh people's videos or what's written in forums about testing these transformers the more, majority of them completely discount the fact that you can not just assume that because for instance in this example that the primary winding just because it happens to be between a certain range that it's the correct resistance for that particular primary winding it just doesn't work that way um you know th this winding clearly is shorted so that it's got a lower resistance than what it should be which is causing it to draw way more current than it should you know how much lower is it than it should be i don't know I'd have to have a, this identical transformer, same exact make and model transformer right next to it and do a resistance comparison between the two. So I just thought I'd mention that because this is a clear cut case of a bad transformer. But if you went strictly by what you see on a lot of videos, a lot of videos will tell you that, oh, you just take that, take that ohm meter, stick it on there. You know, so if I go by 0.7 ohms, for instance, it's dropping as it's cooling off. That's on its way down to a dead short. No, see? Well, the point is, a lot of these videos will say, well, that, you know, between like 0.2 ohms and 1 ohm is normal, or something like that. And, uh, it's just not the case. Alright, this video's already gone on too long. Take care. What you're really just looking for is you look at the... Take two.